Good morning, and thank you for joining the Bank of Marin Bancor's earnings call for the second quarter ended June 30, 2020. I'm Andrea Henderson, Director of Marketing for Bank of Marin. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the call, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have questions, please press 1 followed by 4 on your telephone. If at any time during the conference call you need to reach an operator, please press star zero. This conference call is being recorded on July 20, 2020. Joining us on the call today are Russ Colombo, President and CEO, Tim Myers, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, and Tawny Gurton, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Our earnings press release, which we issued this morning, can be found on our website at bankofmarin.com, where this call is also being webcast. Before we get started, I want to emphasize that the discussion on this call is based on information we know as of Friday, July 17, 2020, and may contain forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially from those set forth in such statements. For a discussion of these risks and uncertainties, please review the forward-looking statements disclosure in our earnings press release, as well as our SEC filings. Following our prepared remarks, Russ, Tim, and Tawny, along with the Chief Credit Officer, Beth Reisman, will be available to answer your questions. And now, I'd like to turn the call over to Russ Colombo. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, and welcome to the call. I hope everyone remains healthy and safe. As COVID-19 persists in impacting our daily lives, we all find ourselves responding to a very fluid situation. In the face of so much uncertainty, Bank of Marin continues to execute on our guiding principles. Relationship banking, discipline fundamentals, and community commitment, which positions us well to assist our customers in weathering the pandemic. At the outset of the public health crisis, the bank swiftly responded to customer needs, including actively participating in the PPP, Since the inception of the program, we have funded over $300 million in PPP loans, helping over 1,800 local small businesses and nearly 28,000 employees. These loans will aid many of our customers in bridging the gap to economic recovery. We also implemented a 120-day loan modification program for borrowers with hardship requests. As of July 10th, the bank had approved over 260 loan modifications, exceeding $386 million. As that program moves forward, moves toward maturity in August, we continue to have active discussions with our customers about loan modifications, and we'll be able to provide more detail next quarter. Although many of our employees continue to work from home, our branches are open and enhanced with safety protocols. And our banking teams across our markets are dedicated to helping our customers. Now I'll turn to the second quarter results. Our performance reflects a financially sound and stable community bank with a proven ability to manage through changing market conditions. We are very well capitalized and our loan portfolio is supported by disciplined underwriting standards, as well as conservative loan to value ratios and personal guarantees. As we reported last quarter, our loan portfolio exposure to the most affected industries is low, which leaves us less vul- with less vulnerability relative to the bigger banks. We'll, we'll give a more detailed breakdown later in the call. Here are some key highlights from the quarter. We generated net income of $7.4 million with diluted earnings per share of $0.55. Cents. Total loans of $2.1 billion were up about 14%, with solid commercial and industrial growth driven by PPP loans. We will not see continued growth from PPP loans because we completed that lending program at the close of the second quarter. Our commercial bankers are working to understand and meet their customers' evolving credit needs. And they are also identifying new opportunities across our markets. We expect these efforts will help to grow our portfolio over time. 
Total deposits increased $473 million in the second quarter to $2.8 billion. Driven by a combination of PPP loan proceeds and increased liquidity throughout the banking system as a result of higher savings rates. The average cost of deposits decreased to nine basis points in the second quarter, reflecting the low rate environment in our relationship banking model. Non-interest bearing deposits represented 52% of total deposits. Our total risk-based capital ratio was 15.8% at June 30th, well above regulatory requirements and the 15.3% we reported at March 31st. While we are very well capitalized, our share repurchase program remains suspended indefinitely as a precautionary response to the pandemic. Management and the board of directors continue to monitor this situation and will reinstate the program when appropriate. Non-accrual loans decreased by $45,000 in the first quarter to $1.6 million, or 0.08% of total loans. Classified loans increased by $1.5 million from the prior quarter to $13.5 million, but were still down relative to the first quarter of 2019. The full impact of COVID-19 crisis will take time to materialize. Our bank is not immune to the significant economic pressures, but we are confident in our conservative lending philosophy and long history of strong asset quality. Finally, due to our continued profitability, the Board of Directors declared a cash dividend of 23 cents per share on July 17, 2020. This represents the 61st consecutive quarterly dividend paid by Bank of Marin Bancorp. The dividend is payable on August 7, 2020, to shareholders of record at the close of business on July 31st, 2020. Now I'd like to recognize an important change to our leadership team. Tim Myers, most recently Executive Vice President, Commercial Banking, was named Chief Operating Officer on June 30th. Tim has nearly 25 years of experience in finance and banking, spanning, spanning small business, middle market, and corporate segments. After 13 years with Bank of Marin, Tim has a deep understanding of our business model and a strong connection to our customers and to our people. I am pleased that Tim was prepared to step up to the role of COO. In these challenging times, stability and consistency in management are more important than ever. Tim will now provide more detail on our PPP and loan modification programs, as well as an update on our overall loan portfolio and expansion efforts in the Peninsula and South Bay region. Thank you, Russ. The bank's execution of PPP is a testament to our dedication to meeting our customers' needs. A small team of subject matter experts devoted a great deal of time and energy to launching the program and helping hundreds of customers get their loans. After receiving approval to become an SBA lender, we formed cross-functional teams that successfully processed and funded more than 1,800 loans, totaling over $300 million. We committed to focusing on small businesses that needed funding to weather the downturn and, in time, help our local markets grow during the recovery. Notably, 73% of the PPP loans were for $150,000 or less, and almost 90% were $350,000 or less. Only 48 loans were $1 million or greater, representing approximately 30% of the total balance. Among all the businesses we were able to assist, we are proud to say there were 178 nonprofit organizations, ranging from education to health and human services, that received $57 million, which helped protect payroll for over 6,000 of their employees. Bank of Marin stopped taking applications for PPP loans on June 30th to focus our efforts on helping customers through the loan forgiveness process. We have contracted with a technology provider and a CPA firm to streamline the submission of applications to help educate our bankers and borrowers on the SBA guidelines, forgiveness process, and necessary calculations. We were pleased to play a key role in this program and are excited to see it through to completion. In the first quarter of 2020, with the onset of the pandemic, we identified industries within our portfolio that could be most impacted. These included retail, 
transportation and energy, medical and dental, hotels and motels, entertainment, private schools, and the wine industry. Not including PPP loans, exposure to these segments totaled $430 million at June 30th, or 20% of the loan portfolio. 366 million of these loans were secured by real estate. The greatest exposure was related to both re retail businesses and retail-related commercial real estate, totaling 198 million, or 9% of the total portfolio, 185 million of which is secured by commercial real estate. Our average loan to value on these properties is 39%, and the majority are also backed by personal guarantees. The wine industry exposure was $77 million, or 4% of the portfolio, of which $42 million is secured by real estate. Education was $67 million, or 3% of the portfolio, of which $63 million is secured by real estate. And hospitality was $48 million, of which $45 million is secured by real estate. We made $103 million in PPP loans to these industry segments as of June 30th, the largest of which were in the medical and dental se sector at $33 million, hospitality at $17 million, retail, which is mostly commercial real estate, at $16 million, and education at $12 million. We also continued to work with customers that needed temporary assistance. Loans for which we processed payment relief requests exceeded $386 million at July 10th. $223 million were for payment deferral, and $163 million allowed for interest-only payments. While our loan modification agreements largely span a 120-day time frame, a small number of customers requested only 90 days of relief. Of the loans on payment relief, almost 50% fell into our expected pandemic-impacted industries, the largest being retail-related commercial real estate at $70 million, hotels and motels at $37 million, and education-related commercial real estate at $25 million. Over 90% of the payment relief loans are secured by real estate and have a total average loan-to-value of 45%. Within the largest categories, average loan-to-value is 43% for retail-related properties, 39% for hotels and motels, and 37% for education properties. Even as we respond daily to the impacts of the pandemic, we continue to look for strategic opportunities for expansion. During the second quarter, we hired Jake Wynn to establish a commercial banking office in San Mateo, focusing on the peninsula and South Bay regions of the Bay Area. Jake is a seasoned and highly regarded banking leader in these markets. Subsequent to joining Bank of Marin, Jake hired an experienced commercial banker, David Mears, and secured an office location in San Mateo that we will occupy soon. This positions us well to serve eight of the nine Bay Area counties, and we are very excited about our prospects south of San Francisco. With that, I will turn it over to Tani for additional insight on our financial results. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. As Russ noted, we generated net income of $7.4 million in the second quarter of 2020. Diluted earnings of per share of 55 cents compared to 53 cents in the prior quarter and 60 cents in the second quarter last year. Net interest income totaled 24.4 million in the second quarter compared to 24.1 million in the prior quarter and 23.8 million a year ago. Second quarter and year-to-date net interest income included 1.7 million of interest income and fees from PPP loans. The tax equivalent net interest margin was 3.53% in the second quarter, which compares to 3.88% in the prior quarter and 4.02% in the second quarter of 2019. Interest and fees on PPP loans negatively impacted the net interest margin by three basis points in the second quarter of 2020. The tax equivalent net interest margin was 3.7% in the first six months of 2020, compared to 4.03% for the same period in 2019. Declines in net interest margin from the first quarter, the same quarter last year, and year-to-date versus 2019 were mostly attributed to a full quarter impact of low interest rates that weighed on our asset yields and put downward pressure on the margin. 
As you know, we previously postponed the adoption of the current expected credit loss accounting standard, or CECL, in accordance with the accounting relief provision in the CARES Act. We will be prepared to adopt CECL when the national emergency ends, or December 31st, 2020, whichever comes first. Non-accrual loans represented only 0.08% of the bank's loan portfolio at June 30. We recorded a $2 million provision for loan losses and a $260,000 provision for losses on off-balance sheet commitments in the second quarter versus $2.2 million and $102,000 respectively in the prior quarter. Under the existing incurred loss model, we made adjustments to qualitative factors to account for the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, primarily the significant increase in the unemployment rate. Non-interest income of $1.8 million in the second quarter decreased from $3.1 million in the prior quarter, primarily due to significant gains on security sales in the first quarter and lower service charges and fees in the second quarter related to COVID-19. The efficiency ratio of 54% reflects continued expense control. In addition to deferred loan origination costs of $890,000 associated with PPP loans, second quarter non-interest expenses are down from the prior quarter due to seasonal first quarter expenses and from the prior year due to reduced data processing expenses associated with our digital platform conversion. The bank delivered a return on assets of 1.01% and a return on equity of 8.53% in the second quarter of 2020. The impact of COVID-19 on Bank of Marin's second quarter performance is meaningful, but we believe our strong underwriting and limited exposure to industries most impacted by the pandemic position us well as we move into the second half of 2020. And now Russ would like to share some closing comments with you. Thank you, Tani. We will continue to address both the impact and the unique challenges created by the pandemic. We enter the second half of 2020 with a strong capital position, high quality loan portfolio, and low cost deposit base. We have a 30 year history of supporting our customers and communities in both prosperous and difficult economic times. I am confident that by continuing to work together, we will all emerge from this downturn strong and poised for growth. Thank you for your time this morning, and now we will open it up to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register for a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Once again, on the phone lines, it is 1-4 to ask a question. Questions can all be submitted via the webcast page by clicking the Ask Question tab and typing your question into the box that appears below the tab. One moment, please. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, on the phone lines, it is 1-4 to ask a question. Our first phone question is from the line of Jeff Rulis with the DA Davidson Company. Go ahead. The line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Yes, I'm interested in the in the response um, on, on a couple fronts um, that you've had. You, you mentioned lowering some interest rate floors, also waiving some some fees. I guess the first one, just on the margin impact, then uh, going forward, is that have you maybe you still take that on a case by case basis, but largely do you anticipate the lowering of floors to to sort of ebb or or stop uh, going forward, and how that might affect the margin? Um, Jeff, I'm going to ask um, uh, both Tim Myers and Connie Gurton to answer that. Tim is directly dealing with his clients um, day to day, and um, Connie can talk to, talk about the. Um, the, uh, the impact on the financials. But Tim, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Russ. Hi, Jeff. Um, we are Hi. reviewing those case by case, case by case. Um, 
going forward, a lot of these are, are lines of credit with renewals and on a mostly annual basis. So at those times, floors are going to get naturally adjusted from where they were when they were done, you know, one or two years ago. So we'll continue to see some impact of that, uh, but I have not quantified that. Tony? Yeah, we haven't quantified, as Tim said, on a go-forward basis because it is on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in terms of um, the current margin. Um, obviously, it's, it's sort of embedded in the full 150 basis point decrease that, um, that occurred in March. Uh, I can... I can um, segment that out and provide it after the call to the analyst community, um, but I don't have a number on that right now. Okay, thanks. And I guess on a related front, though, on the on the service charges, you know, I I'm maybe is it safe to assume that a lot of the waiving of those fees up front was at the front end of this, and then going forward, you might see some resumption or some growth in the in the fee income lines. Yeah, Jeff. This is Russ. Um, yeah, at some point, um, you know, we're trying to be we're trying to be sensitive to our customers' needs and to the challenge that everybody's going through right now. Um, obviously, that's you know we're waiving these fees now, but that doesn't mean they're going to go on forever. And once we get back to a, um, of course, nobody knows when the new normal is or what it is. Um, but as we get closer to a time when we, you know, can have live kind of normal lives. Um, and businesses can resume their normal activities, you know, then we'll then we'll we'll um, we'll we'll make changes in that. But for the time being we're doing that to try and help our clients um, in this really difficult time. Sure. And I just one last one. Um, maybe for Tim, I, you know, I I'm interested in that uh, kind of the sentiment on, on some of the borrowers, those that have that have not that have led to some payoff activity or reduced line utilization, just the behavior that you're seeing, any commentary that uh, you could shed some light on, on what you're seeing? Uh, yeah, I think, Jeff, we it's a combination of things. In some cases, during this last quarter, we had PPP loans for people that were on credit sweeps where uh, PPP proceeds paid down lines of credit. We are seeing people, in some cases, sell assets and use proceeds, you know, that we're not financing, that use those proceeds to pay down other loans. And we're generally seeing a trend, uh, at least over the last quarter, of people just re reducing their, their credit usage. They're not growing at the rate they normally would, which is typically a, uh, a key driver in, in increased usage on lines of credit. But overall, we are generally seeing an increased application of cash borrowers cash to uh, loans outstanding. Jeff, I will add one thing to that. Um, you know, when this crisis began, there were some borrowers who actually withdrew their lines, not knowing what was ahead. And then as things kind of settled down, um, they paid it back. So utilization went, went up initially and then went down. So. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Jackie Bullen with KBW. Please go. The line is open. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jackie. Uh, so I, I realize this is a challenging question. I'm so just curious on your thoughts and expectations related to the balance sheet size. Obviously, there's a lot of different things at play here, but I'm wondering a um, couple of things. Number one how you're modeling the payoff of PPP loans, and number two, how you expect um, funding and deposits to flow around that. Yeah. I will, um, I'll ask Fani to answer the, the question on the modeling of the PPP, which we, frankly, we expect mostly um, a big portion of that, maybe all of it, to be uh, forgiven, but I'll give it to you. Kick it over to Tony. Tony. Well, that's exactly right, Russ. We're um, modeling right now 100% uh, forgiveness on the PPP loans uh, by the end of 2020. 
um, because that's our goal and our expectation, and, and that's what we're going to put our effort toward, is making sure that uh, all of those get forgiven. Um, so was there another question there that I missed? It's just oh, I how you deposit. deposit flows. <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, the deposit flows uh, are going out lower than we originally expected when we had the, we did have significant deposit inflows associated with PPP loan um, borrowers, but uh, it is starting to pick up a little bit now. And again, we expect those flows to go out, be at sort of consistent with the forgiveness timing uh, as we expect those funds to be utilized in order to get the forgiveness. Okay. And are there, in terms of the flows that you saw in the quarter, is there excess liquidity uh, or what you would consider to be excess liquidity uh, not tied to PPP that might stick around on a different schedule? I'm not sure. Yes, there is excess uh, liquidity um, separate from the PPP. I'm not sure how long that will stick around. Obviously, we saw, a fair, we saw some outflows associated with tax day. Uh, recently, so there was some buildup associated with that, but there is increased liquidity in the banking system overall, and, and that seems to um, be adding to our cash position as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just mm -hmm. one more for me, and then I'll step back. In. Um, the, in terms of the San Mateo office that you'll be opening, um, if you could just provide some background on, you know, what kind of hiring is going to take place with that, what your um, growth expectations will be in the longer term associated with that, um, and then just uh, any expenses that we should be on the lookout for. Sure, Jackie. You know, it's, um, Tim Myers is uh, the person that was responsible for that, that office, so I'm going to ask him to, um, to answer that question for you. Hi, Jackie. Uh, as I mentioned in my talking points, we did hire a regional manager and, and uh, thus far one commercial banking officer. Um, I will say in this environment, uh, having just signed the lease, that we're going to play a little bit by ear. Um, I think what we were initially, initially fo fo um, sorry, forecasting while we have, by way of growth expectations, I think we have to review in this environment, so I'm, I'm not – Comfortable saying long-term growth objections, but objectives. Uh, but I would expect over time we have uh, at least uh, one or two other commercial banking officers. Uh, you know, we'll probably support that from a cash management standpoint from our, our other regions. We have a very strong cash management team that's able to do that. And so I don't expect a, a great deal more by way of expenses beyond uh, what Connie's already accounted for uh, thus far. Okay. And, and Jack, Jackie, I just add one thing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. opening San Mateo really, um, really puts in a, us in a position where, where we have commercial banking offices in almost every market in the Bay Area, with the maybe the possible exception of San Jose, and um, or Santa Clara Valley. Um, for the time being, San Mateo will be will be focusing on that in addition to the rest of the peninsula. But um, our whole intent here is to get to establish establish um, banking offices uh, that and and serve the entire Bay Area. So this is a step. Okay. And is this a reflection of a renewed focus in the area? Because I, I know this is you know geographically new for you. Is it is it a renewed focus in the area or is it um, you know did the regional manager just you know, it finally all clicked and you were able to bring this person on board. And so plans that had been in the works for a while, you were able to see them through. Well, we, we had plans in the works to, to open an office on the peninsula. And, um, you know, those those offices, the key, to, the key to opening offices is really finding the right people. And so we were able to identify Jake and, um, and one other person for that office, find a location in San Mateo. And so we, we went ahead with it and, Obviously, this isn't the most opportune time to be open offices given the given the pandemic. However, we had the opportunity, and the person was available, and um, um, we thought it was a we thought it was a great hire, and um, we're we're very excited about the opportunities for us on the peninsula. Okay, great. Thanks for the added color. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
you. Our next question is from the line of Matthew Clark with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, morning. Maybe first on the on the deferrals, as you kind of go through the process with your customers and talking with them, I guess what's your sense, you know, come next month, how much of that might return to normal payments? Do you have any guesstimate or order of magnitude? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab initially, and then I'll kick it over also to Tim. Um, you know, it, it's, um, you know, our, our commercial banking officers have been reaching out to other customers and trying to, to, to get a sense of where they are. And it, it's kind of all over the board, depending upon the industry. Some industries are you know, doing better than expected. Um, some are still struggling. So I would expect that we would have, we would continue to have some deferrals. Um, we would have some that don't go, that end the deferrals or end of the, you know, go, go from interest only back to the normal payment schedules. Um, it's, it's hard to, Hundred percent judge at this point, but um, you know, Tim could probably add some support to that. Tim. Oh, I think Russ. I think that's exactly right. I think this is a big unknown in terms of new restrictions or the rolling back of openings is going to cloud that a little bit. We are constantly speaking with our customers, finding out what their needs are and how we need to adapt. I, I certainly expect that some of these will continue to ask for deferrals. However, some of the borrowers that asked for deferrals very early on that expected to be impacted were not and, and resume payments almost right away. And so I think it's still a little bit murky in terms of the outlook to make any kind of quantification or forecast on that. But uh, we will continue to talk to, the, to our customers and, and figure out the best way going forward. We do have, as, as it's been mentioned, you know, a lot of these loans have significant sponsorship behind them, and that's going to that's going to come into play in making those determinations. Okay, and then on the PPP, I guess what what's your experience been so far on the forgiveness process with the SBA? I mean, that 1.7 million of uh, PPP net interest income was that just accruals? You know, over a short period of time, knowing that you're going to you're assuming all of it gets forgiven by the end of the year, or, or were they actually um, is that revenue that you actually got from the SBA? Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Tony to answer that because I think um, it's kind of a county question. Tony, go ahead. Yeah. So on the PPP loans, uh, right now we are amortizing the fee income that has actually been received already from the SBA. Uh, over the contractual 24-month uh, life of the loans. Uh, as those loans are forgiven, then uh, we will accelerate the fees into um, interest income. So um, if you assume that we are successful in uh, getting 100% of those loans forgiven by the end of this year, all those fees will come into income. Okay, and then I know... Over 70% of them are less than $150,000, which comes with a higher origination rate. What's your updated uh, estimate of the weighted average origination fee when it's all said and done? Yeah, I think it's somewhere between 25 and 3%. Okay. Okay. And then assuming you do get – um, the lion's share of the PPP fees in the second half of the year. I mean, what's your flexibility being able to, um, you know, move some of that into your reserves, or do you feel like um, a lot of that might hit a lot of that might hit the bottom line? We're still, um, you know, actually, we're still evaluating what what that's going to be used for. Um, certainly, reserves are are you know one thing. There's um, there's opportunities to, to potentially help um, people within our communities with some of that, um, some of that coming to income. It's, we haven't we haven't determined exactly um, the total use, but we're uh, we're in conversations internally with the board on um, you know, how we utilize uh, those those funds and um, you know, put them to the best best possible use. Okay, and then FAS 91, FAS 91 benefited you guys on the PPP side by about five cents, it looks like, in the non-interest expense run rate. Um, assume we should normalize that for the upcoming quarter, but what are your overall thoughts on expenses? 
going forward. Sunny? So I think uh, going forward, yeah, you, the 890000 that was included this quarter, those were uh, origination costs um, deferred. So that, that won't repeat. So other than that, though, I'd say that the expenses are pretty indicative of where we're going in the future. Okay. Great. And then, uh, Russ, great to see that you're sticking around. Um, how much of that was, you know, related to, um, you know, not being able to find the talent or the, or the right cultural fit, or, or was it solely related to just being in the midst of the pandemic? We are in the midst of a pandemic, and it's um, it's important to um, to maintain stability, consistency um, um, throughout this time. You know, it's we just don't know how long it's gonna, it's gonna last. We don't, you know, and I, you know, I, I am, I will retire. Um, the question is when, um, but you know, we want to make sure that we keep um, we keep this consistency and um, continuity through a very challenging time for not only for the bank, for our customers, for the general population. I think, um, you know, I guess I, I liken it to uh, changing horses in the middle of a, in the middle of the stream, and we seem to be in the middle of the rapids right now. So it's probably a good time to, uh, to not do <laughs> anything rapid. <laughs> okay. I, I figured. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Our next question is from the line of Tim Coffey with uh, Jenny. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Morning, Tim. Uh, Russ, as we look at the at-risk or the, the loans to industries impacted by COVID, uh, has the balances of those loans changed in the last quarter? Um, no, and I'm, you know, we have Beth Reisman on the line, who's our chief credit officer. I'm going to ask Beth to answer that. I don't, I don't believe there's really been as much in the way of changes of those, uh, of those categories. But Beth, do you have a more color for, for Tim? Yes, uh, this is Beth Reisman. No, there have not been any meaningful changes that I'm aware of at all in those categories. Okay. And what was in the hospitality bucket? What's, uh, what types of industries are in there? We have um, some hotels, some restaurants, uh, things of that nature. Okay. Not, uh, not, a, not um, a lot of restaurants. I mean, if, Tim, I will say this. Um, if we have any restaurants, they're guaranteed. Um, um, but um, they may, and we may have restaurants in commercial real estate that we finance. Uh, typically, we have guarantors with liquidity. Um, so it's not our it's not our practice to be doing a lot of loans directly to restaurants. That's just not an industry we have a lot of um, a lot of exposure to. No, correct. I and I believe so, so. I believe our health clubs uh, we have a couple of those in that industry as well. Yeah, yeah right. Okay, okay. Um, and then Tani, do you have um, the amount of deposits that were tax payments uh, since quarter end? Uh, no, not specifically. We just saw, leading up to tax day, um, some typical build and then uh, outflows, but I don't have specific numbers. Okay. All right. Uh, the rest of my questions have been answered. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And our next question is from the line of uh, David Fiester with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, David. I just wanted to ask maybe more of a strategy question. I mean, given the evolving customer behaviors and maybe more employees working remotely, um, does, how does that change your longer-term strategy and maybe, you know, open up opportunities for additional expense rationalization or, um, you know, back office, uh, office space reduction and, Maybe conversely, I mean, is there anything that you've identified that maybe you need to invest in further or, uh, you know, anything like that to, to keep up with the evolving customer behaviors? Uh, that's, you know, David, that's an excellent question because we have thought about that a lot. And in our, in our strategic planning um, process recently, we met and we talked about um, putting together a, a, um, a strategy and a, 
an initiative to determine, you know, whether we can implement, you know, um, um, a strategy where we have employees who are remote. Um, and there's, there's many benefits to that. Now, we've historically never had remote employees, and frankly, it's part of our culture because we like to have our employees on site and working together. We have our we have our monthly staff meeting where all our employees come together. So we we really work together, and that's part of the relationship building. However, there's opportunities I think to take advantage of um, what we've learned from this. We have a, a big percentage of our, our employees. Um, I think some, I don't know somewhere in the hundred range um, or slightly over hundred, either working at home or remotely from their normal location. So if you if you um, by the way, I'm I'm working from home. I don't particularly care for it. <laughs> Actually, I'd rather be in the office. But but if we t- if you extend that to um, to the future when we're past this, you know, we could if we can use that strategy to attract employees where they, maybe they don't, they don't necessarily have to be in Nevada at our headquarters at one or at one of our branches. It could be in frankly, they could be in Reno for all we care. Um, if they're doing their work from home. And that gives us a lot of flexibility as an organization. It's something certainly the technology companies have employed. Um, the one risk is you don't want to risk the culture of this day. So we have to be careful about that. But we are taking a strong look at that, um, both from a standpoint of attractive employees, and you're right, expense control, because you don't need as much office space. Um, and um, you have to balance that with cult- the culture of the organization. But um, it's a really good question, and it's, when you're forced into these things, like we are in this, you 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 hopefully learn something. I think that's what's great about our organization. We're we're we're, we're, we're ma- taking advantage of this situation and hopefully to learn something about our employees, about the about the way they work and how they work, and um, maybe we can do some things different in the future, which um, hopefully will give us an advantage over over competitors. So. Yeah, it's ex- it's exciting times for sure. Um, I uh, yes, just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the organic loan growth. You know, obviously we talked about the utilization uh, declines and the payoffs and pay downs weighing on growth, but originations we're, we're seeing actually stronger in the second quarter than the first quarters. I guess where are you seeing demand for new credit, and um, you know, has your credit box tightened for new originations? And then just maybe where do you think net origin net organic loan growth exclusive of PPP? Um, those going forward. I'm. Um, I'll make a comment, then I'm going to take it over to uh, to Tim Myers. Um, you know, we've the one thing you, you mentioned about credit credit getting tighter. We've we've been pretty consistent about the way we underwrite, the way we manage our our relationships, and um, um, we haven't necessarily. I mean, obviously, we look at industries different, some industries different um, than we did pre-COVID. But um, but we've been consistent about how we underwrite and the um, the, um, the credit uh, metrics and what we what we do. But um, as far as the the um, um, the new loan volume, let me let me ask Tim to to address that. Of course, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, our year-to-date loan volume, uh, the quarter was good. The year-to-date is not all that far off of where we were this time last year. And I think I attribute that to all the conversations we keep having with our borrowers. Uh, There has been some new customer acquisition in there. If I look at our pipeline today, there there are some fairly large uh, new opportunities. Uh, To Russ's point, I don't think our credit approach has tightened or changed, but it is taking longer to vet opportunities in this environment because while we might be using the same criteria, we have to apply that criteria to a a very rapidly and ever-changing situation uh, related to COVID. Uh, But I have been encouraged by the level of activity of our commercial bankers, uh, as well as the consumer and construction lenders, but they're going to continue calling. If you're talking about future growth uh, beyond what's in the pipeline today, I think by and large it's going to come out of our existing portfolio, but we have been pleasantly surprised at, at a couple points this year. So, uh, we continue to encourage everyone to reach out and do the best we can. Opening this office will help us penetrate a, a large and substantial market down south of San Francisco, but it's almost impossible to predict at what point you're going to get traction in light of what's going on. Okay. Yeah, David, I'd, I'd add one thing to that, too. 
in um, you know, in the underwriting process, one of the important things when you're when you're underwriting and um, working with new businesses, actually to go out and see the business and be with your with your clients and see how they manage their their operation. To me, that's a a huge part of the underwriting and understanding process. It's pretty difficult today to do that. So um, while we're still getting volume, um, it's muted somewhat because of that. Until we can actually get back to a, a time when we can go out and visit and meet with our clients, um, I think it's um, it's going to be somewhat less than we would have hoped uh, originally. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, last one for me. Just um, could you give us? I just want to follow up on the deferral. Um, discussion. Uh, just any color that you could provide. How how much are ninety versus one hundred and eighty day deferrals? Interest only versus uh, full payments. And then, you know, just any initial thoughts on uh, redeferral rates. And then maybe you know whether uh, you know if you do go to a redeferral, whether that's going to um, result in a risk rating downgrade. And if you've seen any risk rating downgrades uh, thus far. Um, I will um, I'll ask our Chief Credit Officer Beth Reisman to answer that, and then I'll, I suspect that Tim would like to probably jump in with some, some color on that, too. So we're still kicking over to Beth. Okay, so our, our plan for the payment deferral was to provide immediate relief and not put these borrowers through an extensive underwriting process. So our standard program was 120 days of either interest only or full deferral. It's split about 50-50 between the two, and um, we did not downgrade at that point in time. We are watching them just because they have asked for a deferral, but uh, again, most of uh, a large majority payments will resume in August, so we are having discussions, and already some, as Tim had indicated previously, some have already reverted to their original payments. Others we're talking to, and we will analyze each one individually fully underwrite and determine what's the appropriate grade if they do need a further um, relief. You know, Tim, did you have some Tim, did you want to add anything? No, I think that was, that was a great answer. Uh, as Beth mentioned, the vast majority of the uh, payment deferrals were the 120 days versus the 90 because that was our program. I don't remember the percentage exactly. Uh, but in terms of risk rating adjustments, as Beth said, it's going to be based on these individualized conversations we're having and what the reason would be for any continued deferral requests and whether, you know, it has a longer, more meaningful impact on uh, what's going on, on the nature of their business and our related credit structure. So I, I, I would echo what Beth said. I guess yeah, with yeah, that yeah. backdrop, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I guess with that backdrop, it, you know, with the, the re-deferral um, or the expir expiration of the initial deferral period kind of being in the next month or so, would you expect if re-deferral rates are, you know, relatively elevated, would you expect the, maybe the third quarter to be the largest reserve build of the year or maybe, I mean, larger than at least larger than the first quarter and second quarter? Or any thoughts on the timing, timing there? Yeah, I, um, Beth, do you have any comments on that? Well, it's, it's going to depend because in our portfolio, we generally are very well secured. Tim gave you um, color on the low loan to val average loan to values, even in the um, what we call the sensitive industries. We also have very strong guarantors. So we anticipate that we will have some prolonged workouts but not necessarily significant losses. And the reserve is to account for losses. So um, it kind of, it just depends. If, if we had significant unsecured loans without sponsorship, my answer would be yes, but that's not the case. Okay. Yeah, David, we don't, we, don't do, we don't do a lot of lending um, um, unsecured. Um, and we're, as you know, just listening to the numbers in terms of advance rates and Things we're, we're pretty conservative on the um, on the advance rates on real estate, and we also look for sponsorships. So, while um, you know, I'm not, you know, there there will be workouts as there are right, with any bank because there are some industries that 
you know, at this time we thought, you know, everybody's anticipated by the summer, you know, we'd have this, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be uh, doing way better, but we seem to be having a bounce back now, and uh, a negative bounce back, I suppose. And so, you know, that's going to cause a lot of people to step back and say, okay, is this, you know, how's it going to affect my business? Um, and um, so um, the, 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 the real benefit for us is that we have done a really good job of, of collateralizing these obligations. And it's, you know, it's not a matter of losing money on, any, on these credits. It's more a matter of just working through them and working with our clients, which is what we do historically. I will, I'll, I'll remind you that during, um, during the, the, the financial crisis, we actually didn't foreclose on single property, and we we um, we worked with our clients and got the best results uh, because we did work with them, and we had guarantors that were very strong that could solve problems and make not make their problem our problem. So um, I think we're headed for some of that as we go forward. Um, but you know, it's about it's about building it's about the relationships we have with our clients and working with them to for the best possible results. Sure. That's, that's extremely helpful. Call it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And there are no further questions on the phone lines. Okay. If there's no other questions, I want to thank everyone for your attention this morning and for for, for calling in to listen. Um, I um, I hope everyone is healthy out there, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Um, Next quarter, hopefully, hopefully we'll be um, we'll be in a better position from the standpoint of the, the health of, um, of this nation. But um, in the meantime, um, all the best to everyone. Thank you for calling in.